I'm Norman Borlaug, an agricultural scientist who spent the last 43 years uh, of my life in third world food deficit countries trying to do something about increasing food production uh, in those areas of the world where there's great uh, need for more food and where a large part of the total population uh, is undernourished uh, or malnourished. Uh, it's particularly frustrating to me at this time uh, to find ourselves in a situation where there are huge gluts of uh, food that have been accumulated, especially in the food exporting nations. But more recently, also in some of the nations that were thought to be uh, hopeless situations from the standpoint of producing their own food, they too now are entering into export markets. Uh, nevertheless, this uh, brings home to me uh, what I've always believed, that uh, we have at least two different aspects of these, this food problem. One is to produce enough, and the second is to distribute it equitably. And there we run into the problem of poverty and lack of purchasing power for a large part of the world's uh, population. During the current situation, uh, it's estimated by the World Bank that there are still 700 million people, approximately, who are short of food. Many of these are in African nations, but also in some of the other developing nations. Uh, now. Uh, those of us who have uh, worked in trying to assist the third world food deficit nations to improve their productivity of food and we need to remember that in many of these nations anywhere from 75 to 85 percent of the total population live on the land mostly in subsistence agriculture producing only enough for their own need and scant quantities for sale uh, to buy the other basic necessities that they must have. Uh, now we hear angry voices from many of the food exporting nations that we have destroyed uh, the markets uh, by this uh, uh, working to assist the third world nations to improve their productivity of basic foods. I disagree with this uh, and I think I can best describe it that uh, beggars are poor customers and that the only way the third world nations have to improve the standards of living of their people, which are, I repeat, largely rural, is through uh, increasing first the productivity of the land, uh, production of food and fibers, which they in turn must be able to sell first to supply their, much of their domestic demands and then also to uh, export in those commodities where they can produce efficiently into international markets. It's not uh, apparent on the surface today, but uh, I think anyone who sat, sits back and looks at this picture suddenly begins to realize that more than ever before the economies of the world are all more and more intertwined not simply in the agriculture, food and fiber uh, sectors of the economy, but this has to do also with basic uh, uh, mineral commodities which are used by the industrial nations. And we find today depressed prices uh, everywhere. In part, this relates to not overproduction just in one sector, but uh, in many sectors. Uh, many of the industrial nations have found themselves uh, in difficulty uh, because they themselves through internal economic policies uh, attempting and very often by strong uh, influence of special interest groups uh, have increased the standard of living of that particular uh, group that makes that product up to a point where with improved technology in other industrial nations such as uh, West Germany and Japan, they find themselves priced out of the market uh, either from the standpoint of cost of production or from the standpoint of quality control. And so as I look at this complex issue today, and my main concern is uh, with food, yet I realize that the issues that uh, we are looking at are much broader 
and really the whole world economies and the future of the world are all tangled together like never before. Well, the agricultural scientist who is uh, talking to us today started out as an Iowa farm boy, if I am correct in my information. Is that right, Norm? Yes, sir. I was born on a small farm in the extreme northeast corner of Iowa. Uh, this was a general livestock farm. We sold no cash grain. Uh, but it was there that I gained much of my practical experience as a farm boy. And I'm a product of a one-room country school, uh, a very small high school. Uh, I matriculated at the University of Minnesota during the worst of the economic depression after having stayed out of school for uh, one year to try to get together a few dollars with which to uh, start my higher education. And I'm sure that I would never have been able to have attained this uh, university education had it not been for some of the emergency programs that came into being during the economic depression of the 30s. For example, uh, the National Youth Administration, which permitted us to work uh, to gain enough money to pay for part of our tuition. Later, when I was part, partially th through my first uh, uh, course of study, which incidentally was forestry, uh, the Civilian Conservation Corps came into being, and as a young forester, I could drop out of uh, the university for six months or a year and work as a uh, CCC uh, group leader uh, in various types of forestry and soil conservation uh, programs and consequently gain enough money to go back to receive my degree. Uh, but all of that vast experience, even though it was in forestry and conservation, together with the farm background that I acquired as a growing boy and youth, uh, has served me very well in the last 40 years in working with the the third world countries. I need to point out that uh, later I went back to graduate school and uh, broadened my education. I majored in plant pathology, uh, took uh, general courses in genetics and plant breeding and agronomy. And uh, then after I graduated from the, received my doctorate degree uh, shortly before Pearl Harbor, I went to work for, the, for a chemical company. And uh, during the war years, I served as a head of a biological laboratory, not engaged in any biological warfare or anything of this kind, but in doing all sorts of uh, biological research for uh, need for the armed forces. And when I was relieved from, uh, released by the War Manpower Commission in 1944, I joined the first Foreign Technical Assistance Program uh, namely, the, in agriculture, namely the Rockefeller Foundation Mexican Government Cooperative Program. This program uh, was designed to assist Mexico to improve the yield and production of its basic food crops, namely uh, corn, wheat, and beans. Later, other crops were added. Well, before we pick up and go ahead with that story, you, you, you've moved us to Mexico, and, I, and, and, and that's when we really get serious. But before we do that, there, there are two questions I'd like to ask uh, about the, your earlier life. One is, it seems to me that uh, you were raised with a good dose of the work ethic. Is that a fair statement? Yes, of course. I, uh, I uh, to this day, am a firm believer that in order to be successful in increasing food production, uh, there's a lot of drudgery uh, connected with the agricultural science. There's a lot of hard physical work. And when you're working in third world countries, such as today, in many of the African countries, or 40 years ago, the conditions in Latin America and in Asia were certainly uh, similar to those, if not quite as bad, to those in Africa today. And this means that you have to have motivation and dedication to try to assist the young scientists of the host countries. In order to be effective, you've got to live the back country. You've got to live under uh, bad and work under bad conditions very often for long periods of time away from your base. 
uh, if you're going to gain credibility and if you're going to uh, be able to understand the problems and the culture of the host country in which you're posted. Is that more important than any aspect of your college education? Uh, to me, all of these pieces dovetail together. And for a foreign technical assistance uh, scientist to be effective, he has to be interested in the host country in which he's posted. Uh, he has to go beyond looking at the agricultural and technical problems. He has to be concerned with uh, learning about the history, trying to uh, learn as much and as well as he can uh, the language uh, of the people of the country in which he's posted. Sometimes this, of course, is impossible. In a country such as India, where there are a large number of languages, you have to try to at least gain some working knowledge of the number one language that's used in the scientific field and then supplement it with the other major language that's used insofar as possible. When you but came to Mexico, did you know Spanish? When I came to Mexico, I knew not one word of Spanish. And I can still remember the first day when I spoke and said buenos dias to our late good friend, Mr. Abin. And it was tremendously embarrassing for me to have said those first two words. And there was a big psychological barrier that I had to overcome. You, but you did overcome it. And uh, I did, and with all my brute strength and awkwardness, uh, speaking bad Spanish, and it's still not, uh, it's still a long ways from perfect. Uh, but uh, I, of course, over all of these years, have learned the vernacular, and uh, when I moved through Latin American countries, uh, I can pick up the colloquialisms and know most of them from one country to another, and this is of great assistance when you are working not only with the scientists and the government leaders, but also with the bureaucrats and all of the other uh, echelons of uh, people that you come in contact with and with whom you must communicate effectively if you're going to uh, be effective at the job that you're assigned. This is quite apart from the scientific aspects of uh, developing a program. One other point that I think is very effective or important to understand uh, in trying to become effective in foreign technical assistance programs uh, is that there has to be a continuity of personnel. Uh, people who serve for one or two years uh, in a country uh, simply can't acquire the understanding of the history and the culture and of the most important problems of the agriculture that they're trying to assist to improve. It takes time. It takes continuity. Moreover, we need specialists uh, well trained in the different disciplines. Uh, but we need something more. We need a few integrators who can see the big picture, who can take the data that are being developed by the specialists in the different disciplines and fit those parts, individual parts, the disciplines of the jigsaw puzzle of production together into a meaningful way and then test this new package of technology first on a few farms, a dozen or two dozen farms the first year, and then modify that package of technology to get a better fit uh, and a greater efficiency. And the next year tested on a couple of hundred and the third year on a thousand or more. And in the process, you also learn to know the, both the strengths and the weaknesses of this technological package uh, that you are trying to transfer from experiment station and laboratories to farmers' fields. And you make the adjustments, but you understand the risks that are involved compared to the old technology. And that package has to be put together in such a way that uh, you have the potential to, or that the package has the potential to increase the yields at 50 to 100, and very often it can be two or 300 percent compared to the traditional ways. And this must be achieved with the reasonable level of risks, 
uh, from the standpoint of those that will be in, uh, encountered by the farmer who's trying to adopt this new technology. Once well, you've, you've had a long, long career in Mexico, so you certainly fit that criteria. You've committed yourself and you've been here for, what, 40? Three going, years. Yes. You came in 1943, however, and at that time, uh, all this risk was ahead of you. Is that correct? All of this was unknown. There were very few trained people in Mexico, and I should have pointed out at the outset that one of the aspects uh, of the cooperative Mexican government Rockefeller Foundation program was to train a core of young Mexican scientists in all of the disciplines that bear on agricultural production and consumption. And uh, uh, this was a long, painful process in the beginning. Uh, it was in the waning years of the war when I was released from war manpower. I came here and it was impossible to buy scientific equipment. Uh, we had to patch up the old discarded tractors to scavengerize one to uh, put uh, another of the same model into operation, all sorts of things. Uh, we had no physical facilities such as these elegant ones that we occupy today in the International Mason Wheat Center. But I think uh, everything considered, the greatest return that uh, we ever obtained from those humble beginnings and through the 17 years that this program was in operation before the responsibilities were turned over to the team of young Mexican scientists uh, was the best investment that the Rockefeller Foundation has ever made. In those 17 years, it uh, spent uh, $6 million. Uh, this included the uh, salaries, uh, operating program costs, uh, scholarships and fellowships for several hundred Mexican scientists and uh, also the uh, building of the first uh, uh, rather uh, simplistic but functional uh, headquarters for research, uh, agricultural research here in Mexico. Moreover, it included building the first graduate school for agricultural scientists. And when one looks at the returns uh, that first came to Mexico, uh, and then much later with the transfer of this technology, speaking specifically of wheat, to India and Pakistan, to Turkey and many other countries of the world, the return is of such a magnitude that it's uh, difficult to comprehend. Uh, simply let me put it this way, uh, to describe something of the magnitude of that impact in one year on one crop in one country, taking the case of India, the average production of wheat in India from 1960 to 1966 uh, before the new technology was introduced was 11 million metric tons. Uh, last year, 1986, the harvest was, uh, was 46.8 million tons. In other words, there was an increase in production of uh, 35 million tons compared to the base period of 66 when the new technology was introduced. That increased uh, gross product value of the wheat crop for 1986 was about $4.5 billion that went into the pockets of these small farmers. Moreover, uh, that increase in production over the base period uh, provided 65% of the calorie and protein uh, for an additional 260 million people. Uh, that illustrates one case, one year, on one crop. And that, that was the result, it seems to me, of the dedicated work of individuals who just started out at a very simple level and moved ahead. Is that a correct way of... That thinking? was the result of a small number of scientists uh, and a team effort across disciplines. Uh, most of the background work that was done was done by young Mexican scientists working in close collaboration uh, with the 
the maximum number of uh, uh, foreign scientists that uh, was here during that 17 years was 17 uh, foreign scientists. But uh, most of the time it was uh, many less. And uh, some of them moved on to other countries and used that experience elsewhere. But mostly the background information was done by young Mexican scientists uh, with a few of us from the outside. And we tried to build the efficiency and we looked for leaders for Mexico for tomorrow in these various disciplines. We also looked farther. We looked for a few on, uh, outstanding individuals that had the broad interest. These are what I call integrators. Uh, you can't find integrators across disciplines very easily. The way the graduate students are organized, not only uh, in the United States, but in most of the developing nations, uh, they begin to develop specialists very early. They become deeply interested in their own narrow field of interest, uh, which we need. But we have to have certain individuals that have broader interests that look at the broad picture and how to put those pieces together. So far, I've only talked about uh, the technological aspects. That integrator also has to uh, be sensitive to what the technology alone can do and cannot do. In other words, uh, he has to be sensitive to what economic policies uh, can do to permit the adoption of the new technology. And uh, unless he's aware of this and at least uh, has a working knowledge of the economic policies or economics and uh, how they can be man manipulated uh, with economic policy. You can't get the new technology into operation. Is uh, culture also an important thing to understand? I, for example, I understand in some third world countries the envy of the farmers who didn't participate, of those who did and therefore had all these uh, increases in yield, was a significant problem. I think that uh, we, one of the great criticisms that we had early, especially as we moved the technology in wheat, and it was largely a direct transplant. Uh, let me go back just uh, a bit. When we began this program on wheat improvement in Mexico in 1944, uh, Mexico produced 360,000 tons of wheat. It was still importing at that time 60% of its cons uh, uh, consumption. Uh, through the development of the technology, improved varieties. But let me point out right now that there's no magic in an improved seed. Uh, the seed, the improved variety, has incorporated into it the genetic yield potential to produce high yields when it is properly grown. Uh, it also if, uh, will have incorporated in it, if it's done properly, resistance to the most important diseases, such as the rust. But simply having the seed with this potential won't produce more food. Uh, the soil fertility levels have to be restored through the use of the right kind of fertilizer. Once this is done, it uh, creates a whole new series of interactions uh, in the soil. It stimulates weed growth. Uh, the weeds prior to uh, proper fertilization are also anemic, just like the crop plant, the wheat plant that you're trying to grow. And, uh, but once you restore soil fertility with proper fertilization, then you have a no, whole new game of competition between weeds and the wheat plant. And this has to be contended with by cultural practices or, in some cases, with the proper use of herbicides. Uh, you also have to contend with the, uh, with the uh, insects, which are not particularly important in wheat com in contrast to certain other crops. But uh, the, the point that uh, was made very often was uh, 
especially in India and Pakistan, when we transferred the technology from Mexico. And let me retrogress just one minute. Mexican, Mexico became self-sufficient in wheat production in 1956, about uh, 12 years after the program was started. Uh, at that time, we produced about a million two hundred thousand tons. Last year, the production was five million tons. The change in wheat yields in Mexico from the time we began in 1945 uh, was uh, about 750 kilos per hectare, about 11 bushels per acre. Uh, last year, the national average was four and a half tons, roughly about uh, 75 bushels per acre, uh, quite a change. Now, when this technology was transferred to India and Pakistan during the crisis of the middle 60s, the food crisis there, uh, it was tested for three years on farms, uh, in small plots first on experiment stations, then three years uh, on farms. And uh, in that transfer, there were very few people involved. Uh, Dr. Ignacio Narvaez, one of my first uh, Mexican wheat colleagues here, took a leave of absence and moved as a resident consultant uh, to Pakistan, where he was contracted by the Ford Foundation. And he, largely alone, uh, with my uh, spending a month, six weeks of the year with him, uh, was responsible for bringing all of this technology into better focus under Pakistan conditions, working with young Pakistani scientists. And Pakistan has increased its production from about three and a half uh, million tons of wheat in 1966 to 13 million tons last year. Similarly, in India, when the transfer was made there, we had only two foreign scientists. The, the late Dr. Glenn Anderson, a Canadian uh, all-around wheat scientist who served there for eight years, and Dr. Bill Wright, an agronomist. They were the people who made the transfer, and I spent as much time as I could there. Uh, now, the criticisms that were leveled that uh, very often is that we made the rich richer and the poor poor. The little farmer got left behind. But the truth is that that's a gross over-exaggeration and a twisting of facts. In India, most of this big change that I've mentioned uh, in production uh, was done on farmers' fields of, of from two to five hectares, which is uh, certainly not large farmers. And uh, most of the four and a half billion dollars that uh, was the gross increase over the base period of the 1986 harvest went into the pockets of these small farmers. So I think that uh, there are a lot of learned papers written in academia that are poorly based simply because they have not studied many of these problems in the country where the change is taking place. When you were first uh, doing this, I understand you applied a rather unique research approach. Uh, going back to the breeding program, which made possible this widespread transfer of the improved seed types of wheat that were developed here in Mexico, uh, we need to remember that uh, 45, 50 years ago, the dogma of the time was that if you were to develop a high-yielding, well-adapted variety. You had to make the cross between the two parents and then select the progeny of each of the succeeding generations until you obtained a stable, uniform line in the soil and climate conditions under which you hoped to grow that crop. That was absolutely essential to get the, the proper match between genotype or variety and the environment. Uh, when I arrived here, uh, I took a look at 
uh, the two main producing uh, wheat areas. One was Sonora, rather new soils on the uh, coastal plain uh, of uh, the west coast uh, in the state of Sonora and in the northern part of the state of Sinaloa. There, in 1939, 40, and 41, there had been three devastating epidemics of stem rust. In the Bajio region, the old central part that had been cultivated since early colonial time, the yields were miserably low, uh, 500 kilos per hectare. The soils were worn out. These were the two uh, areas on which we focused. What I was taught in graduate school, and this was true not only uh, at the University of Minnesota, it was the dogma of the times. Uh, I repeat, you had to select in the environment and the soil in which you were to grow this crop. It took, using that, those uh, methods, 10 to 11 years to produce a rust-resistant variety. Since we had had three epidemics in 39, 40, and 41, only three years before we, I arrived, I decided that time would run out and we would have another epidemic long before I could produce a stem rust resistant variety. So I threw the textbook away and I looked for two contrasting environments where the wheat plant would find uh, conditions favorable for growth at different seasons of the year so that I could grow two generations a year of breeding material. This was done by planting when the farmers planted in the coast of Sonora in November when the days were getting shorter at latitude, 29 degrees of latitude, only about uh, 100 uh, feet above sea level. Uh, the best plants uh, we created artificial epidemics of rust. We selected the best plants, and those that had good plump seed uh, were harvested in late April, and we shuttled the seed of these plants back here to the high valleys of uh, central Mexico, originally to Chipingo, uh, the Valley of Mexico, which is located at about 19 degrees latitude, in other words, 700 miles farther south and at an elevation of about 2,200 meters, 7,550 uh, feet elevation. Or somewhat later in Toluca, a nearby valley, the same latitude, and uh, 1,000 feet higher in elevation. There we planted in May when the days were getting longer, and we harvested the best plants that survived the disease conditions in October, and again shuttled the seed of those best plants back to Sonora. By so doing, we produced varieties, a, a rust-resistant variety of good yield and good quality of grain in four and a half years rather than ten. And we had this multiplied twice each year also, uh, so that it was on farmers' fields in five and a half years rather than eleven. By, uh, more important was that we soon saw that uh, some of the variety, some of the lines that which became varieties, uh, fit equally well in the high valleys under summer conditions, in the Bajio, the central area of worn-out soils when they were properly fertilized, and in the coastal plain of Sonora. Uh, this simplified the seed multiplication problems. You didn't have to have 20 or 30 varieties to fit into these small, many uh, small eco niches or mountain valleys. Uh, instead, you could get by with one or two varieties that fit broadly, and it simplified the seed multiplication and distribution problems. Uh, 20 years later, when we begin to test these or their subsequent improved models, uh, that had been further improved by dwarfing so that they responded better to fertilizer and better to moisture and water management. When we tested those in India and Pakistan and subsequently in many other parts of the world, uh, they were very much at home in those environments because they had this broad base of adaptation and a broad disease-resistant spectrum. Exciting concept. 
In 1970, you won the Nobel Peace Prize. In recognition of the work you've done, perhaps this unique research activity, etc. Has that recognition helped in the work you've been doing since? Well, uh, as far as our wheat program is concerned, uh, uh, this was well along the way and had good uh, international acceptation uh, before that happened. But certainly it has helped agricultural research in a much more broader context. Uh, suddenly agriculture acquired a little prestige. It was not necessarily a second-class science and especially uh, when the Green Revolution as it became known in Asia unfolded and started to show uh, the true magnitude of the change that was possible in wheat production and subsequently in rice production uh, first in India and Pakistan and subsequently in other countries of Asia and uh, Latin America. Uh, this uh, in itself added prestige, but in 1971, a year after the Peace Prize, then suddenly uh, there was uh, an emphasis to uh, raise more monies to back up what had been a new movement based on this first Mexican uh, Rockefeller Foundation program. Uh, there were two people primarily involved for laying down the foundation for this international group of uh, institutes uh, of which there are 13 today, international agricultural research institutes scattered around the world working on different crops and animal production problems. The two people uh, that had great vision and that uh, established the first of these was the late Dr. George G. Harar who was the first director uh, of the Mexican Rockefeller Foundation cooperative program. He uh, was not only a good scientist, but he knew how to handle people. Uh, he was a humanist and the person who understood uh, uh, the cultures of different people and how to manipulate not only at the scientific level, and at the farm level, but also at the economic and political policy making levels. He later moved on to become the president of the Rockefeller Foundation. And shortly before he became president, he was instrumental in pointing out to the board of trustees of the Rockefeller Foundation that during the 60s, there was going to be a food crisis in Asia and uh, this was going to be because of the neglect of research and the transfer of technology to farms on rice. And so he, together with the vice president of the Ford Foundation, F.F. Uh, F. Hill, a man also of great uh, vision, got together and established the first International Rice Research Institute. Uh, Simmet became the second. Those two foundations founded the first four uh, institutes and they were uh, either in operation or being built in 1970 when the uh, Nobel Prize was awarded to me for my uh, work in collaboration I must point out with many Mexican scientists and scientists from other countries who merit a lot of the uh, uh, credit for what was achieved. This called world attention to the need for expanding these research, international research organization and the consultative group on international agriculture came into being in 1971. Today this group of 13 international agricultural research institutes uh, have a budget uh, something on the order of two hundred million dollars which is provided from about thirty seven or thirty eight governments from around the world both uh, developed nations and developing nations Mexico and India for example uh, contribute to this uh, fund uh, that sounds like a lot of money two hundred million dollars a year but remember I mentioned that the increased gross product of the wheat crop alone for one year in India in 19, 
86 was four and a half billion dollars. So what I say is that uh, investments in research uh, pay off big dividends if they are properly organized and if the transfer of that technology is executed so that it, the results are carried to farms. Unfortunately, one of my great frustrations today when I look at Africa is that there's a great deal of technology available on experiment stations, both in international institutes and in national institutes of the host countries that's not being transferred to farms and that is not being used to increase food production in these most miserable countries where uh, hunger and famine are rampant. Is and one of the reasons for that, uh, we've heard on the news that uh, it's the local dictator. He doesn't want this to occur. Is that true? That's where uh, one can blame economic policy of the host countries and the developing nation. That's an oversimplification of the fact. Certainly it's one of the great obstacles. But I mentioned earlier that in triggering off the so-called wheat revolution in India and Pakistan, we had only one resident scientist in Pakistan and two resident scientists in India. They knew the technology. They had worked with it here in part and few of our staff, and at that time we had very few staff, international staff, spent time with them assisting in organizing the program and in uh, working with the young scientists of those countries. What's missing in Africa right now are a few of those integrators like Narvaez and Anderson that have both the scientific skills, uh, understanding of all of the interacting disciplines, uh, workable knowledge of economics so that they can at least converse with the economic planners at the right time and uh, that have the courage at the right moment to speak in the right tone and with the right bluntness to get the economic and political leaders to change those policies that are obstacles to progress at the present time. But simply changing economic policy and political policies won't transform food production alone. It has to have a viable package of uh, agricultural technology that has the potential, when properly applied, to increase dramatically the yield of the particular uh, crop that you're dealing with. Not only just one crop, that integrator has to have a field for the other crops that the farmer will grow because invariably these small farmers must try to get the maximum income from that uh, small piece of land over the course of the year. And when you're dealing with uh, tropical or semi-tropical uh, areas of the world, very often uh, either where the rainfall is rather well distributed throughout the year or where there's supplementary irrigation. You can grow two or sometimes more than two crops a year on the same piece of land. And so the integrator has to have a feel for the other crops also uh, that uh, are possible, uh, that can possibly be improved and therefore in the process not only increase the yield and production of the one crop, for example, in this case, uh, wheat, uh, in the case of India or Pakistan, but also know something about rice or about cotton or the other crops that might be planted during the summer season. He has to be uh, an agriculturalist in the broadest of sense in order to try to bring these pieces together. I relegate this whole thing to uh, my first profession, forestry. When you look at the big picture of a big mountain uh, watershed covered with forest, uh, the forest is made up of many trees, very often uh, trees mostly of one species of different age, but frequently uh, it will be made up of many different species. Now most scientists, the specialists, 
uh, like to do their research in the shade of their own tree, their own discipline. But the management of that forest has to be, if done properly, managed in such a way that it's the integration of the shade of all of those trees and that that forest will be managed for the uh, maximum good on a sustained yield basis, not only for production of uh, saw log timber for producing lumber, but for paper and pulp and for firewood as well. But equally important is that it be managed properly for flood and erosion control so that it, the irrigation reservoirs down below are not silted up much before uh, their calculated lifetime. Moreover, that forest should be managed from the standpoint of maintaining a, s a reasonable habitat for many of the wild species that inhabit that forest ecotype and hopefully for outdoor recreation. So what's needed are not only the specialists standing behind the individual trees, but that integrator who moves into the gray areas between those individual trees and knits together this package of technology into a management plan uh, that uh, will produce these multiple benefits. And at the proper time, he will have to wander into this boggy, swampy, no man's land of economic planners uh, and gain their confidence by showing what is possible if the right economic policies are laid down to stimulate the adoption. For example, going back to the wheat crop, after the technology has been proven to be viable, uh, then you have to convince the policymakers that the right kind of fertilizer is available at the village level six weeks before the onset of planting. There has to be credit for that small farmer to uh, buy that fertilizer before planting and pay for it at harvest. Uh, the government has to make uh, some uh, has to announce before planting that at time of harvest, uh, the farmer will receive for his grain a price equivalent to that in the international marketplace. When this is done, it permits the small farmer to adopt the technology. And even though the farmer uh, is convinced of the benefits of the technology that he has seen demonstrated on his land or on neighbors' lands, uh, he can't adopt the technology unless these uh, economic policies are straightened out. And of course, when you are manipulating this, the integrator uh, has to realize that he can bring pressure to bear on these policy makers by setting the grassroots of fire. By that I mean after we had had 1,200 demonstrations out on Indian farms, I, knew, uh, I do not know how many hundreds of thousands of farmers had got the message about what was possible. Uh, when the new technology was made available, the seeds and how to plant them and when to plant them and how to control the dis insects. And when the fertilizer was available and the credit and the uh, price, these farmers knew what was possible. Then, when they were made aware of the fact that uh, now the policies had to be changed, they were the people who pers uh, applied the pressure to the political leaders for the fertilizer, the credit, and a fair price. But somebody has to bring all of these threads together. And you have to know when to keep your mouth closed and when to change from a Dr. Jekyll to a Mr. Hyde and speak bluntly and crudely. And if you do it too soon, you'll be thrown out of the country. You will be completely ineffective. And there's no way to predict this. You have to live with it. You have to have antennae like a longhorn wood bore and know when the timing is right to move in the policy area to deal with the economic planners and the political leaders. 
but with the pressure of the grass roots of fire, uh, you are less vulnerable than you think. But if you move too soon, you'll trip and fall and probably be disgraced and thrown out of the country. Well, Norman Borlaug has not done too much tripping. We can, we can observe that. I'd like to move back to the United States, Norman, and on this question of economics, which you've been discussing, what are your views about the situation in the United States? I mean, we're worried about farmers going out of business because they fail. Well, today the agricultural situation in the U.S. reflects uh, the whole tangled mess of subsidies and distortions in the international marketplace. But it's not just in agriculture. Uh, let's go back, turn back the time clock. Uh, first glancingly, uh, during the early 60s, at some of the Cassandras and doomsayers of that time, uh, when the crisis was building uh, the food shortages and famine uh, in India and Pakistan, uh, some of my friends, the Ehrlichs and Paddocks and their ilk, uh, said uh, there's no hope for India. Let it sink. It's a hopeless cause. Uh, then when the Green Revolution came along and changed all of this, uh, they were mute for some time. But in the early 70s, when a lot of the land that had been taken out of production in the U.S. Uh, was not put back into production early enough, it coincided with the, the two severe droughts in the Soviet Union and in China. And so the, the large accumulated stocks, similar to what we have today in the world, uh, overproduction, if you will, uh, they were depleted and they went too far. And suddenly there was a rapidly increase in food prices and there was an outcry by the consumers, not only in the United States, but in the developed nations of the world everywhere. Uh, then again, our Cassandras uh, were in loud voice. Uh, and they were joined by others, like the Club of Rome, saying the world has run out of its ca ca capacity to produce the food that's needed. The population monster had taken over. And what happened? Uh, coinciding with this, almost uh, within a year's time. The OPEC nations got a, a control on the petroleum energy prices and prices escalated from two or three dollars a barrel first to 18 and in a year and a half to 28 and shortly thereafter to 32. Uh, then again, uh, these same Cassandras were talking about, you see, we've run out of energy as well. Now, some of the best young farmers in the USA at that time, and a large number of them, said, well, if this is all true, we're running out of our ability to produce our food. I'm going to buy those two small farms nearby that are uh, not economic units. And there was lots of credit at that time because all of these petrodollars were pouring into New York banks and were being filtered out to the rural banks because nobody knew what to do with all of this money. And so these farmers went down and uh, took out a mortgage on their own land to buy these two small farms. And this triggered off the ones that got on the, with this early enough, bought it at reasonable price. But soon there was a great speculation and skyrocketing of land values. And many continued to do this at these inflated levels, uh, paying high interest rates as well and suddenly the bu bubble broke the last few years and the prices came down. Many of them have gone into bankruptcy. Even the small banks, many of them who made bad loans uh, have gone broke or are in great difficulty. The same thing happened in uh, petroleum, both in the USA and also, unfortunately, in my uh, second nation, Mexico. And it's all tied together with the great increase, increase in price of petroleum. In the USA, uh, there was a great movement to increase production. Many of those old fields that had gone out of production because they were producing only two or three barrels, uh, young entrepreneurs and some not so young could go down and get uh, credit to start re-drilling some of these fields. And some of them 
uh, these wells began to produce eight or ten barrels, some of them a little more, uh, and it was good business. When, uh, when the prices were thirty, thirty-two dollars a barrel, but when the price uh, bottom came out of the petroleum thing and went down to ten, twelve barrels, many of those people went broke also. But not only those small operators, but also the suppliers of the equipment, uh, the manufacturers of the equipment, uh, the servicing uh, of these, they went broke also. So you see it's not just agriculture. All of these things are tied together. And then with all of those petrodollars uh, in hand, the banks, uh, I think many of these large bankers acted more like fuller brush salesmen. They didn't know what to do with all of this accumulation of petrodollars and they came running around to many of the countries uh, that had petroleum deposits, including Mexico. And they said, look, you've got all of this petroleum in the ground. Uh, there's lots of credit now. Uh, but the interest is rather high, but it'll soon be higher. The price of petroleum is now $32. It'll soon be 50 and probably 60 within the next 10 years. Uh, here, you better take this. and You better start drilling these uh, new fields and making more exploration and get this money, out of, uh, oil out of the ground and get your industrial uh, operations going. And large loans were taken out. Uh, Mexico, not only Mexico, Nigeria, Venezuela, many other countries. And then the bubble broke there. This points out that all of the economies of the world are uh, tied together indirectly and inadvertently tighter than ever before. It affected many of the, uh, the developing countries that were exporters of basic minerals, be it copper, lead, zinc, when the prices went up, there was euphoria. And when it's collapsed, uh, they're all in deep trouble. And the indebtedness of the third world nations is such that today, with the depressed prices uh, and unemployment in many cases, uh, the burden of paying the interest is such that it's, it's uh, to many of them, it looks like a hopeless cause. And I'm fearful that it will also generate social and political instabilities. I've been amazed how stable many of these deeply indebted countries have been up to the present time. But for those in the developed affluent nations, they better learn the lesson once for all that the world has shrunken and that uh, all of the economies of the world are more interdependent than ever before not only from the standpoint of energy and many of the other basic raw materials, but uh, that uh, there's no easy solutions to these problems. And let's remember this, that the surpluses of today in food uh, may not be there for too long. The uh, population is growing at 85 million more people each year. That's 165 each minute. And uh, what was surpluses, like they were in the early 1960s, can become shortages like they were in the 1970s. And this can repeat itself in the 1990s unless we continue to push forward. This population monster attacks us on many fronts, not just food. It, it affects the environment, uh, we live in and many other aspects. Public health, employment or unemployment is all a very important part of this picture.